from the Psych Hub Podcast Network. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Burnout Antidote, infusing well-being into healthcare culture. I'm Amy Perlman. I'm here today with my colleague. Hey, Paul Dager. Good to be back with you, Amy. Thanks, Paul. And today we are going to talk about substance use disorders and other addictions in healthcare clinicians. Yeah, what an important topic to include for so many different reasons. And and recognizing that, one, we're going to make this a broad discussion around the topic of the experience of addiction. So substances, but there's also process or behavioral addictions that people have. Um, Also, this idea of stigma and how that is such a barrier to people getting um, the necessary care for recovery. Um, So, And because we're talking about um, something work-related, how often substances and other process addictions are used as a coping tool. Um, So we're going to go broad on this topic, but I think we're going to give it the broadness it needs for a good, thorough discussion. And I want to speak to, this was going on before COVID. I remember learning about organizations who, rather than immediately taking somebody's license away, that offered them an opportunity for healing and recovery. Um, and that the stress within healthcare already, there is a high prevalence of substance use. And I, th- I haven't looked at latest stats. I've ill prepared, Amy. I didn't go in the research this time. I'm sorry. Um, but I think we know that Substance use disorders increased during COVID, so I can only imagine that was healthcare clinicians as well as the general public. And I think that there is this other component here, and maybe it's tied to stigma to some extent, Paul, but yeah, even as we were introducing the topic or this episode, I think substance use as a coping strategy really has come with this mm-hmm. idea of kind of coping with humor to some extent, that in addition to the access to substances, or even if you think about Mm -hmm. the idea of like overworking as an addiction, there really are tons of components here that encourage people or give them more access to use substances. I think the idea of substance use as an escape, but also substance Mm -hmm. use as a way to socialize or something that has mm. become kind of lighthearted in discussion, whereas right. it's not really a lighthearted to- topic for people who yeah. are um, suffering from addictions. Yeah, yeah, and how that creates a further sense of otherness, I imagine, when some people are speaking of this in light terms and it may be destroying your life. Huge yeah. culture components here for the broader society, mm-hmm. but in the healthcare realm as well. Yeah. Agreed. So for our story this week, um, Paul and I um, approached a, a colleague that we both know who is in mm-hmm. who is in recovery. This is someone who has taught me quite a, a bit about recovery and about the impact of substance use disorders in the workplace, but also really just in life in general. So I'd love I'd love to have have him share a bit of his story with the group. Amy, I think a little context Mm -hmm. also regarding this story Um, for someone who may be, um, maybe they haven't started their recovery um, or they're early in it, that this is, this is hearing from someone with long-term recovery, um, which I think brings amazing value, um, but also not putting pressure on yourself if you're just starting out. Thanks for highlighting that. I think about this idea of, of being an expert based on your, your own experience um, mm-hmm. kind of that, that lived experience of knowing that we are each the own, our experts in our own lives, that this is just one story. Yeah. Um, and it happens to be a story who's of someone who's had quite a bit of experience in recovery, but it doesn't speak to every story. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's uh, listen and see what there is to learn. My first job was at a County Department of Health and Environment. It was a drug and alcohol program. And I really tasked with working specifically with the adolescents uh, that would come in uh, for services, their families, and then their subsequent uh, criminal justice or uh, social work interactions as well. At this particular organization, we were not encouraged to share anything about our own recovery experiences if we were in recovery. And there was at least one other person on my team who was in recovery. 
And both of us felt a little conf conflicted about that. There was a piece of me that thought that perhaps it would be helpful to join a bit and let them know that I am a person with lived experience. But the other thing I struggled with was also my age. I was still very young in my uh, mid-20s. And in some circumstances, I thought, who am I really to share my experience when these are parents who are in their 40s, 50s, who are dealing with adolescence? I have none of that. I, again, I, it was early in my career. I was very conflicted. I wasn't encouraged to share that. And when I got to my second organization, it was, it was actually quite refreshing for the staff to, to say, Eric, it's okay. You can share that. Uh, those experiences. And they would caveat that a bit with saying, but be strategic with how you do that. And what they meant by that was being conscientious of my own experiences and how they may impede someone's ability to find their own pathway to recovery. That was something that I really tried to strike a balance of. And I, I will admit that for the first couple of years in my uh, second job placement, I, I still continue to not really share that about myself professionally. And it wasn't until probably the last couple of years that I was at that particular organization that I felt a bit more comfortable bringing it out when I thought it was appropriate or it seemed to make sense in that circumstance. When, when people were, were really struggling with, for instance, how do I go to my first 12-step meeting? Or I don't understand what my kid is thinking and those kinds of things. And so I did find that there, there were times where I, I felt a bit more comfortable bringing it up. So I moved away from direct care into something that was more administrative in nature. And, and uh, by that point, I had gotten to a point where I had been doing so much counseling that I really had a desire to make a bigger splash in some kind of capacity. I wasn't quite sure what that meant yet. But once I got into that more administrative function, I really settled into a routine of supporting an organization that was launching a, a behavioral health product for a number of different em employers that, that had a particular health plan that was integrated with medical and behavioral health. It really was something that resonated philosophically with me from that perspective. It actually, for probably six, seven years, the first half of my career at that particular organization, didn't really have an opportunities to bring up the fact that I was in long-term recovery. And I continued to develop those years and learn in my recovery uh, along the way. It wasn't actually until the, the last seven years at my former employer that I, I became reacquainted with how do I share this aspect of myself. And at that point I had taken over some SUD and opioid overdose response strategy responsibilities for the organization. So what that meant was that I really had to work across the entire organization in a number of different capacities to think about how we as an organization were going to address this issue and then how we were going to do that in a way that was conscientious of state and federal policy. And so there, there were definitely times where in order to have a sense of legitimacy of why would they choose this Eric Bailey guy to do this, I did take an opportunity to start to shape some of my own messaging and my own identity to be strategic with, with how I actually shared that about myself. Uh, I will say that the, the legitimacy that's given to people with lived experience has taken on a new level where recovery care organizations exist in this country and so forth. And I think in some ways that's really helped to have that le that legitimacy to help uh, improve the um, competency and, and the comprehensiveness of the workforce in this space. A couple of takeaways from this as a person in long-term recovery would be to be strategic with how I share that with individuals in the context of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Being able to recognize who my audience is and when it may be helpful to bring in my own experience and when it's better to just simply listen and to pull in information and not insert my own experience, which, which sometimes can actually be counterproductive, which I've definitely seen that occur in the past as well. I think for me, that's really helped keep me grounded and to recognize that those experiences do have a role to play, but it's not necessarily everything. Recovery definitely weaves its way into to every aspect of my life, and, and it has for, for almost 33 years now, but recovery isn't the only thing that defines me. I love that you highlighted um, our colleagues' stage in recovery because it was very clear mm -hmm. from from that impression that there was some space from the yeah, amount of time yeah. with substance use that space and perspective that comes the with perspective it, yeah. that comes with it. And I think um, 
when you think about one day at a time, those days do add up. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to minimize mm -hmm. um, that recovery is hard work. But I also do want to acknowledge mm -hmm. that I think it does get get easier over time. Yeah, th there was so much richness um, that heard an evolving understanding of self and, and where substances fit in. And even though the focus was more, this was um, someone talking about self-disclosure with clients, I think there's also considering self-disclosure with coworkers um, as far as where I'm at in my process of recovery. And, and also I heard a strong um, sense of where is it safe to share and where is it not safe to share? And, and again, I always want to take this back to systems and the collective. Are we creating an environment where it's okay to be human and have flaws? Or are we reinforcing the myths around superheroes? You know, healthcare clinicians are perfect and superheroes and have no flaws. And, and I think that was something I heard in his evolution in different workplaces. There became more recognition of it's safe to be human here. And I, I like that juxtaposed with timeline and how our culture as a larger system mm. has, yeah, yeah. has evolved as well. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I'm pleased with where that evolution has gone in terms of bringing in an increased humanity. And I almost thought about it as two cultures, one of a workplace culture and one of a recovery culture. Oh, interesting. And Somewhere. where do those align and, and where do they uh, kind of bump heads maybe? I started thinking about a okay. recovery culture around this this 12 step process of owning who you are, um, owning your addictions and building a community. And mm -hmm. that with this idea of pulling back on self-disclosure, having a workplace culture where you, maybe you're expected to be a superhero in your world. I'm like mm -hmm. in your words is mm -hmm. what I meant, Paul. Yeah, yeah. This idea of having to live in kind of two worlds, almost thinking about this as okay. a, a story about recovery more than a story about an addiction, um, even though okay. that spectrum of addictions like really has yeah. included recovery. Well, what I hear in that is, okay, if, if your workplace is not a safe place to share, then finding that someplace else in your life mm -hmm to make sure that you have um, a place where you can begin to reinforce what are the components needed for recovery. Um, the other thing with that timeline part that stood out to me was, I love when he talked about when he came to a workplace where disclosure was a little more accepted and recognized as powerful, not just for self, but for other healing um, or others healing, how he said, I got reacquainted with how to share. And it takes me back to actually last week's episode on storytelling yeah. and that every time you do reveal a story about yourself, um, it, you know, I remember, okay, I'm going to kind of go on a tangent, but it, it'll, it'll tie back in. Trust me. If you look at how memories are formed, every time you recall a memory, you're actually reconstructing it. And that's the beauty of narrative therapy, where you can now become the author of your own story. And that's what I heard with this reacquainted with sharing his recovery story of each time you revisit it, you get to retell it in a way that moves you forward in the process. And, and to me, that is really important to remember that it's not written in stone, that as we retell the story, we can add layers of insight that maybe weren't there earlier for no fault of your own. It just wasn't time yet. Like that writing this idea. So I love how last week's episode and this one tie together with the power of story. I want to tie it in and I'll throw some, I'll throw a statistic in there too for you, Paul, because I know you missed those. Oh, we, we haven't, haven't had, had one, one yet. So yeah, we need one. So um, <laughs> I started thinking quite a bit about self-disclosure and mm -hmm. what is that impact on self when you start to think about, are there parts of you that you can't have present or what you can choose mm. to be visible and what yeah, you yeah. don't choose to be visible. And I also mm -hmm. started thinking about what was the impact of that for people that we work with. I, I have a hard time with the patients or clients or the us and them. So I, I don't always know what words to use. Um, okay. But when I looked, and this was a study around therapists specifically, but 
Yeah. Over 90% of therapists report self-disclosure in their work. And mm-hmm. that that also showed an overwhelmingly positive result in two ways. One, that the client, patient, people we serve, the other perceived yeah. that humanity as more of a connection, even if the disclosure was not something that they had mm. in simul- like in, in common. Okay. Okay. And the other component, and I don't remember the numbers on these two, but the other component is that the therapist felt that they did a better job regardless of what the oh, outcome was. And I really want to okay. focus on this like feeling of be, of doing a better job because that's what I felt tied it to burnout in my mind. Okay. Is this... That idea of having an impact. Having yeah. an impact, being genuine, all of that, building a connection that seems to improve yeah. the relationship on both sides. Um, okay. So I just wanted to throw that in there because that to me felt very different than even how I was trained in terms of blank slate, um, right? kind of sitting, sitting behind the couch type of therapy, which doesn't feel as genuine to me. You know, and, and another quote that I have from, from our story today is the legitimacy of lived experience. And that's what I'm hearing you give the sense of as a clinician, when we show up with our flaws, and I, I, that may not be the best word, but when we show up with our chinks in the armor, our I, humanity, I don't know what we want to use. We sh- our humanity, there we go. Our our imperfectness. We'll go all yeah. the way back. Got, got to bring up Tekla. We haven't right. done that in a while. When we bring back being imperfectly human, um, that that has a power with not only ourselves and our colleagues, but with the the, the patients as well. And and I want to. Coming back to substance use disorders, the stress that healthcare clinicians have been under pre-COVID and then COVID just multiplied that so many times. I I get people grasping for something to feel better, even when it had short-term gains. And I really want to honor the fact that you guys are working hard out there and you deserve to feel better. And and some of you may have reached out for substances or other process addictions to do that. And you're, you're going to be okay. And just people who care about you. I feel like I'm a bit of a rant, but I can't help myself here. And this idea of your story has value when you're ready to share it, it has value and power around this topic. I love that, Paul. I think that's the that's the part where I'll I'll put my my hand on my heart for you. If you were in person, maybe my hands on your back. Um, but really offering that level of support to yeah. think about recovery is not linear. I yeah. think we've we've seen this in our in our own lives, whether it is a formal addiction or it is a pattern in our mm-hmm. lives. I think that's something we can all relate mm-hmm. to. And thinking about the culture of when you question, is this in the realm of a disorder or is this Mm -hmm. something that is a, um, a reaction to a certain event or is this something Mm -hmm. that, um, is this something I'm concerned about or the people around me are concerned about and being able to have that conversation with people in your life, in your lives, and what would mm-hmm. it be like to have that conversation in the workplace as well? Yeah, yeah. I, I think there is a slippery slope mm-hmm. here. Um, and when I'm hearing you talk about this idea of, of functioning and when do I start to notice I'm not functioning as mm-hmm. well, not just due to the stress itself, but due to my coping tool, in this case, uh, the substance. Um, and mm-hmm. that's when it's time to take some steps. And I want to honor the fact that in delivering patient care, we want to make sure that the patient is safe and do no harm. I'm not discounting that, but I'm taking you know, have yourself part of the equation of what needs to happen next for the well-being of myself and my patients. And that makes me think of one of our skills of self-compassion and really going into that component mm. of understanding that yeah. this level of stress or moral distrust is not sustainable. Mm-hmm. 
and that yeah. all of us have different ways of coping. Some of them are more functional than others. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you who can't mm -hmm. see me, I did just give a little air quote because I'm not sure that's the right word I want to use, but some work better yeah. than others. And this idea of authentic authenticity or self-disclosure, and it could be self-disclosure around struggling with a peer or a supervisor, yeah. or it could be mm -hmm. self-disclosure around a common shared challenge or recovery with people that we serve, really creating this community. Yeah. You know, as you were speaking, what occurred to me is tying this back to moral distress and moral injury. By definition, it's traumatic. And if if you are experiencing moral distress, you have you are experiencing a form of trauma and that you deserve to be healed and feel better. And so with today's episode, it's recognizing that maybe the first way of feeling better is causing you further harm. And it's it's time to get some good help because you you can recover. Just like from our story, our story shared today, recovery is possible. I think that brings us into uh, some of the self-exploration that we'll take as um, as our takeaway mm -hmm. skill for this week. But some of that is, how do I cope? How is that working mm -hmm. for me? Right. Who can I talk to to help me get different perspectives? That also brings in last week's storytelling to some extent of mm -hmm. sometimes we don't always see what's working and what not, what's not working as well as our peers may mm -hmm. be able to see with us. So who's a trusted person around that and the impact? Right. And then I also encourage people to think about this idea of self-disclosure. Does your workplace have a policy around self-disclosure? How do you mm -hmm. react to disclosure from your peers or from your patients? Mm -hmm. um, especially when that is coming around addictions, I think. What are those um, ideas we have in our minds around what mm -hmm. addictions mean? And yeah. then I also wanted to think about self-disclosure in terms of what feels safe and what does not feel safe. What are mm -hmm. self-disclosure is not always the answer. Where are your boundaries? What do you want to mm -hmm. share and what do you want to keep to yourself? in terms mm -hmm. of uh, doing this work? And when would you want to share it? With whom? All, all good things to ponder. And I want to get a little practical as Go well for it. on this topic. <laughs> um, in researching today's topic, um, I came across programs, um, another for nurses by states, and I can't remember the acronym, but it's basically... Um, Many of the states, I think the majority of them I noticed, actually have programs where you can self-report that experiencing a substance use disorder to, and, and these programs work with the board, the boards in your state, and rather than immediately just license over career gone, um, making a commitment and a plan and follow through on, on recovery. And so imagine how terrifying it may be to think about, you know, decades you've invested in this career and it could be ripped away. There's programs out there set up specifically for this scenario um, to a way to um, maintain your, your license, get the treatment you need, and then return full and recovered to the work you love doing, helping others. Thank you, Paul. Sure. Oh my goodness, Amy. Are we almost at the end? I know. The penultimate. How often Whoa, do you get to use big that word? word? <laughs> You've been waiting for this episode to share that one, haven't you? <laughs> um, so yes, the finale. I see it has an exclamation mark in our notes. Um, and I agree. This um Wow, I look forward to wrapping things up with you, but also I'm a bit sad to say uh goodbye to our audience but one more folks come on back next week <laughs> where we hope to wrap it all up and um maybe we'll give a little best of or favorite parts from me and paul around the work that we've been doing together thanks for joining us on the journey cool see y'all again next week Bye. if you'd like to reach us you can do so at podcast at 
to be notified of new episodes, don't forget to like, subscribe, or follow wherever you're listening. And reviews are so helpful, so please do leave one if you can. It allows others to find us and to join along. The Burnout Antidote is executive produced and edited by Jacob Morrison. Research is assisted by Tecla Ross. Show artwork was created by Ornella Jangoli and Ashton Smith. A very special thanks to Juliana Castro, Alyssa Fackler, Trevin Stiegel, Andrea Womack, and of course, our pet, Pickles. The Burnout Antidote is a co-production from Psych Hub and is brought to you by Janssen Neuroscience.